Well, Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly making it clear today that President Trump's extreme vetting executive order is lawful and constitutional. Kelly testified before a House committee also criticizing the Washington state federal judge's ruling halting the order. I have nothing but respect for, uh, for uh, our judges, but they live in a different world than I do. I'm paid to, to worst case it. He's paid to, in a very academic environment, uh, make a call. And I don't criticize him for that. That's his job. But I'm uh, the one uh, that is uh, charged with protecting the nation, the homeland, and I tend to do that. Yeah, he's got the real deal job. Meantime, we're standing by again for that Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling. The, the one-hour hearing has, been, has taken place, uh, and we'll find out, it could come at any moment, what happens out in San Francisco. Meantime, joining me now, former chairman of the Republican National Lawyers Association, Randy Evans. And Randy, uh, I, this whole case gets to be kind of wonky because of the legal rules about it. I've got a little cheat sheet here about what happens if they rule this way or that way. What, what's your take on this uh, Ninth Circuit even being involved in? There's some question about whether they even have the right to be. Well, that's right. I mean, really, there are three basic issues that will be at play here. The first is called standing, which is whether or not these two states have the ability to even bring the lawsuit. To do that, they have to show they've been aggrieved or they've been harmed. Their argument is to say that there are individual citizens in their states, such as companies and universities, that are being limited because people can't get back into the country. The obvious question is, why aren't those people the plaintiffs as opposed to the states? Really, I think if, if, if the court, uh, Ninth Circuit follows the law, the case should be kicked out on the standing issue alone. Yeah, but, the that, second issue, but that's the key, the second, if they'll follow the law. But you know... The reputation of the Ninth Circuit is very liberal and the most overturned circuit court of any of them by the Supreme Court. So do you, do you believe that they always follow the law? Well, I think the Ninth Circuit is certainly the most liberal circuit in the entire country, and they are the most reverse circuit. Um, I think here we're at a little bit of a disadvantage because should this liberal circuit decide to uphold the ban, then it would go to the U.S. Supreme Court, where it would end up a 4-4 tie, leaving in place the district court judge's right, ruling right. in Washington. You can think about how crazy that would be. Think about the additional time pressure that would put on the timing of Judge Gorsuch's nomination and confirmation before the U.S. Senate. It would put enormous pressure to, to get him, to move that a little faster, move it up the track. I was listening to the conference call uh, before coming on the show tonight, and there was uh, back and forth about the fact that the uh, Solicitor General for the state of Washington was arguing for the state of Washington and Minnesota. And he said that, uh, listen, if, if you go along with our, our, our idea, ju the judge in Seattle will have a hearing a week from Friday to actually have a hearing on the merits. So it sounds like they're still thinking about speeding it up, but I wouldn't expect that that would change anything. Well, I think implicit within, within that is an admission on the second part, which is whether or not the federal government, specifically President Donald Trump, got his day in court. Remember, the hearing on the temporary restraining order was a bit 15 minutes or so, and they really didn't give an opportunity for anyone to be heard, briefs to be filed, any kind of record. Imagine enjoining the President of the United States who has made a determination that the national interest of the entire country is at stake and he wants to vet, more severely or significantly vet, people coming into the country. And you have a sitting district court judge in Washington deciding, oh no, I'm going to overrule the President's determination of what's in the best interest of the country. You can see why I think they're backing off of that a little bit and they're insisting, oh no, no, we'll give a hearing, we'll have a really fast hearing. But, but, but I know this isn't a fact-gathering case, but at the same time I was listening uh, the just judge from, uh, that's in Phoenix, the 85-year-old, the oldest one of the, of the judges, he was asking about, well, has anybody really been arrested from any of these any of these seven countries, I don't think that's happened. And in fact, uh, Byron York reported earlier today, 60 people since 9-11 from those countries have been arrested for terrorism. So the facts get all mixed up in one of these cases, don't they? They really do. I think that's President Carter's appointee you're talking yes. about here. Yes. And I think he was, the one, he was the one who was expressing some suspicion about, well, has anybody actually ever been arrested? 
Prior to this, the answer was yes. That's how President Obama's administration decided these are the seven countries from which we need to do more significant vetting, where we need to do a better job of vetting. And so it shouldn't have come as a surprise. But had they had a full evidentiary hearing before issuing a national ban, oh, basically vitiating, uh, overruling the president, they would have known that before today. Then, then these questions would have been answered. Randy Evans. That's right. You're good, right. Thank you for your expertise. Thanks for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. You bet.